Uh, how many, if I can see a show of hands, how many have seen the video of, uh, of Victoria Newland and our ambassador in Kiev, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, uh, talking about how they were going to arrange this coup in Kiev? Well, okay, not too many. So let me let me see if we can bring that one up now. Um, is is that the video queued up? The one with Newland uh, talking to Payet? What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. Um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Boke and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, kinda... I, 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 just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, the three-plus-one conversation or three-plus-two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, – Klitschko has been the top dog. He's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got. And he's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three. And it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. I uh, can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does, if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And, again, the fact that this is out there right now, I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych that. But in the meantime, there's a party of regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we could probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay. This coup was the most blatant coup in history. It was advertised 18 days beforehand. 
on YouTube <laughs> when a conversation, an intercepted conversation between Assistant Secretary of State Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt was put on YouTube on the 4th, on the 4th of February, 2014. Now McGovern, <laughs> being used to a little bit of a little bit used to coups and what happens if they're divulged ahead of time, breathe a sigh of relief and said, oh, poor yachts, poor yachts in your he's never going to be prime minister now that the, the coup's blown. Well, apparently, Vladimir Putin had the same reaction because he stayed in Sochi for the Winter Olympics, never decided to come home. And lo and behold, on the 22nd of February, there's the coup. Now, we know enough about the coup now to know that it was arranged uh, by, with thanks to the Western Intelligence Services, if you could put it that way, and uh, we know the result. Now, for just a little bit of background, why did Victoria Newland, uh, who, whose claim to fame is working for Dick Cheney and who is an arch neocon person, why did she decide it was so important to get the Russians, to get them over the barrel in, in Ukraine? Well, um, it goes back to the year before. The year before, when uh, if we could have the, the, the second slide, when I say slide, the year before, when President Obama, to his credit, was reluctant to start another war in the Middle East. They wanted him to bomb Syria. He didn't want to bomb Syria. He even said, you know, I'll go to Congress. Oh, that's a big deal. OK, now here was a New York Times op ed after Putin pulled Obama's chestnuts out of the fire. I hope that you can see it. It appeared on September 11th, 2014. In the midst of all this, this appeared in the New York Times, and it said that my working and personal relationship with Obama is marked by growing trust, trust, the coin of the realm. Then he objected to something. Then he said, you know, uh, his speech, uh, that Obama speech last week really bothered me. I don't agree with it at all. This business is about the exceptional country, being able to do exceptional things. No, no. The way I look at it, there are big countries and small countries, rich and poor, uh, one with long traditions of democracy, others different, their policies different, but we're all different. But when the Lord's blessings look, look on us, we must not forget that God created us all equal. Now, I was told at the time by a pretty good source that Putin penned that last paragraph of that op-ed himself. And confirmation of a kind came about two years ago when he gave an interview and uh, sort of off the top of his head, he said precisely the same thing in almost exactly the same words. So what does that mean? Growing trust? What does that do to the Mickey Mat? What does that do to the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, academia, think tank, complex, which grew like Topsy after Eisenhower's warning that uh, unbridled influence of, these, uh, of this MIC, the military industrial complex, would be a danger to our democracy. Uh, a little footnote there, Eisenhower said the only antidote to that is a fully informed American citizenry. And we have that far from that now. What's my point here? Uh, this was the high water of our relationship, September 2013. It took the neocons not even a year, about a half a year, to stage the coup on the Maidan in Kiev. Uh, the, the causal relationship was not something that McGovern dreamed up. Bob Perry and I went through this in detail, and it seemed, uh, and actually I had a, uh, I had a catberg seat, at the, at the top of the CNN building, when Joe Lieberman and Paul Wolfowitz were talking about this as though, well, it, it looked like a funeral there. They had missed their chance. They didn't get their war against Syria. And so a lot of this was reaction to that. They had a lot of time to prepare. 
and they invested five billion billion with a B dollars into Ukraine's aspirations to join the West. Okay, so here we had a decent chance for growing trust. Okay, doverai no proverai, trust but verify. Uh, this was all shunted aside by the coup arranged primarily by Newland and uh, Pyatt and the other people who were doing the dirty work and acquiesced in by our French and our German allies. They were there. They saw what happened. Steinmeier, uh, the German foreign minister, I met with his principal deputy and I started talking about the coup in Kiev. And he said, get this. He said, what coup? He was there, Steinmeier, and the French took it upon themselves to guarantee the Minsk process, and they didn't have the chance, they didn't have the guts to follow through because the US didn't want it. So maybe I'm an offensive realist, but that's how I 